Good morning, uh, good afternoon, variously, to viewers who are in different time zones around the globe. Uh, my name is Jonathan Elkind, and I'm a senior research scholar at the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. On behalf of the Center, I am very pleased to welcome you to today's program, examining the global energy and climate implications of the dramatic events currently unfolding in Eastern Europe. Less than a week ago, many people were debating whether Russia would do the, uh, what, what seemed to some the unthinkable and attack its sovereign neighbor for a second time, only at much greater scale than in 2014. Numerous governments engaged in intensive diplomacy to try to avoid that outcome, but unfortunately last week seems an awfully long time ago. Now we watch regular reports of troops encircling major cities in Ukraine, of civilian populations huddling in basements and other improvised bomb shelters. Hundreds of thousands of people are fleeing to the west of the country or over the border into safety. Russia's war in Ukraine has been underway for barely a week. And even as this tragedy is unfolding and conscious of the fact that human suffering continues as we speak, Today, we will begin the process of trying to understand the impacts of these unfortunate events. Today's program takes place in this context, one of very preliminary assessments. Um, to date, um, European, American, and other governments have tried to introduce sanctions with sharp teeth and serious impact, but they have tried equally to avoid affecting directly energy trade. Nonetheless, energy markets are on edge with oil trading at more than $100 per barrel. In fact, Brent today uh, in excess of $113 per barrel when I last checked, and natural gas trading in Europe at more than five times prices from this time last year. Yesterday, the members of the International Energy Agency announced that they will release 60 million barrels from strategic reserves. And now debates are unfolding as to whether this decision will have impact on the markets. Some governments are considering what they would have, what would have been unthinkable steps only a short time ago. New natural gas storage obligations, stockpiles of coal and more. In this context, we are extremely fortunate to have an outstanding lineup of presenters who will help us engage in a survey of the initial energy and climate impacts of the violence in Ukraine. We have asked each of our speakers to deliver brief remarks on a particular facet of the problem, uh, and we will then engage in a question and answer session, which I will moderate uh, using questions that are provided by you in the audience uh, using the Q&A function that you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Today's program is on the record, and a video recording of the program will be available on the website of the Center on Global Energy Policy and on our YouTube channel uh, in the coming days. With that, let me introduce our speakers for uh, today's program. We are exceptionally pleased to have with us uh, Ambassador Pierre Vimont, a senior fellow uh, with Carnegie Europe. Uh, Ambassador Vimont has had a distinguished career in the diplomatic service of France, serving as President Emmanuel Macron's uh, special envoy uh, on relations with Russia. Before that, he served in a number of absolutely outstanding and important posts as the first ex executive secretary general of the European Union's External Action Service, as France's ambassador to the United States, as France's ambassador to the European Union and a host of other posts. Uh, he also uh, serves as uh, in, today as a visiting professor at Columbia University's School of International and Public Affairs. Gerson Reiser is, uh, a, is counsel at the Clifford Chance Law Firm in Frankfurt, where he advises clients on white collar crime and compliance issues. Among other areas of specialization, he focuses on compliance with economic and financial sanctions. Dr. Kirsten Westphal 
is executive director uh, of the H2 Global Stiftung and leads that foundation's analysis and research division. Until the end of last year, she served as a senior researcher at SWP Berlin, Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik. And she has been to our great satisfaction, a frequent colleague and intellectual partner of the Center on Global Energy Policy. I will note that Dr. Westphal will have to leave uh, the program uh, at the top of the hour. So when we get to questions and answers, if you have questions for Kirsten, please uh, come forward with them quickly. Uh, we are unfortunately unable to have with us today, Dr. Chi Kong Chong uh, from the University of Cambridge, who unfortunately was uh, uh, detained by uh, other circumstances um, uh, today. Dr. Pierre Noel from the Center on Global Energy Policy will be our next speaker. Pierre is a global research scholar with CGEP. Uh, he is based at Columbia University's uh, Center in Paris. His research interests focus on the intersection of international energy markets and public policy. Last but not least, Dr. Harrison Fell uh, is another one of my colleagues from the Energy Center at Columbia. He is a senior research scholar he is trained as an environmental and energy economist, and he co-leads our center's power sector and renewables research initiative. With that, I will turn over the floor to Ambassador Vimont for uh, initial remarks to help us understand the context in which our discussion takes place today. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, to this conference. Uh, I will be short, certainly, uh, because it's, uh, it's uh, not easy to foresee how events are going to unfold in the, um, uh, in the next few days and weeks and maybe months also. And therefore, I would like to sketch out the kind of uh, political background uh, in order to help your own discussion on energy and climate matters in the best way possible, and give you maybe some of the political parameters that we're going to face in, in the next uh, few days, weeks, months, and maybe years, unfortunately, because uh, this may be a long haul uh, affair as, uh, as one can, um, can fear. Uh, Let's not uh, underestimate the fact that uh, uh, as early as last week, we all thought that this conflict would maybe uh, a conflict mostly focus on the Donbass region, on the eastern part of Ukraine. And this is not what has come out at the end of the day. This is a conflict and a confrontation um, that has changed NATO now and that uh, now uh, uh, comprehends the whole of Ukrainian territory. Uh, and secondly, it seems to me the nature of that conflict is moving not only into a conflict between Ukraine and, and Russia, but more importantly, a conflict between Russia and the whole Western world. Uh, and this is how President Putin is, um, is underlining the nature of that conflict nowadays the fight against the empire uh, of lies. Um, and uh, I think this also has to be taken into account. Um, three or four possible scenarios um, to help uh, your listeners, uh, the audience, to understand where we may be going. One, unfortunately, I don't think um, we can put bet a lot of money on it, would be a Ukrainian success. And, um, stopping the Russian uh, advance, forcing the Russian military uh, and the Russian leadership to a ceasefire and for Russia to call it an end right now. Um, this doesn't seem to me um, uh, the most predictable outcome of this, of this conflict, if only because if we look at what's going on, on the ground, uh, Putin is doubling down to some extent his advance, and we're going to see much more of the uh, Russian military might in, in, in the days ahead, unfortunately. Um, therefore, I would more rely on three other scenarios, it seems to me. Uh, one, where you still have a high intensity resistance from the Ukrainian side, and therefore the Russian troop advancing, taking over major cities, 
Kharkiv, uh, Kiev, uh, Mariupol, maybe even Odessa in the days ahead, uh, but with strong high intensity resistance. And therefore we will be in a sort of a, a quagmire, as it has been said by some colleagues in different think tanks, and a situation that could be confused. Um, uh, the Russians being in, in Kiev will topple the government, certainly, which way I don't know. Um, uh, but this government, Zelensky government, could just uh, run away and keep on fighting somewhere else um, in, in Ukraine. And therefore, we would have a, a second government being there, a puppet regime, as some would say, um, and the fight would go on in different ways, um, in cities where uh, insurrection would go on, um, and in the countryside also, where resistance may start to, to, um, uh, to operate. And therefore, it would be something akin to what the Russian Soviet Union at the time, that time faced in Afghanistan, or, of course, we shouldn't compare, but something akin to Northern Ireland uh, uh, during the 70s and, and the 80s. Um, the other scenario would be a low intensity resistance from the Ukrainian population. In other words, uh, the Russians in the main cities, um, the morale of the population being somewhat um, reduced um, and diminished by those military success, but still uh, ongoing fighting going on um, and therefore a somewhat unstable uh, situation. The last scenario, one I hope will not happen, would be um, uh, a scenario where um, Western Alliance, NATO, would be involved. Um, and uh, for different reasons, incidents at the border with Poland, Romania, or other East, um, NATO countries, um, uh, infighting starting here and there, incidents taking place, would be slowly uh, roll into this, this conflict. And of course, with this, the prospect of possible nuclear incidents also, and um, uh, Russian leadership has not been um, parsimonious in its warning that it could go right into a nuclear um, conflict. So let's be aware of that. Uh, three parameters to watch as we as um, as we go along. First of all, the actors on the ground. What is going to happen with the um, Russian military force advancing? We have seen that they have logistic problems. We have seen also that some of their young soldiers seem to have a very low moral. Um, so we have to watch this very carefully. Uh, we need to watch also how the um, Ukrainian army and Ukrainian population are going to behave uh, and how they're going to resist. And I told you a few minutes ago that there could be high intensity, just as low intensity resistance, and we will have to, to watch this very carefully. And lastly, I think looking at other actors on the ground, even beyond the borders of Ukraine, it's how in in Poland, in Romania, in Hungary, in Slovakia, with the influx of uh, inflow of um, Ukrainian migrants and the pressure from public opinion in these countries to act and to not allow uh, this uh, conflict to go on and for the Ukrainian population to be um, uh, flown over by shelling, uh, by, by this conflict, the outcry in many of these countries is going to be huge. And people are going to ask for more support and for more, perhaps, military support. And we have to take that into account. Second parameters is how things will go on in Russia and how the public opinion is in official circles are going to watch this uh, ongoing uh, struggle um, uh, it is, and sometimes we have maybe missed that point. Um, this is a civilian war. This is a war between brothers, and it has a totally different dimension from a, a typical uh, international conflict, as the Russians have gone into Afghanistan in the 70s, or more recently in Georgia, um, or in Syria, or even today in Libya, or in Africa. Uh, this is a war between uh, two population that know each other very well and that very much linked together. 
Um, and I think we have also to be aware of that dimension. Um, so far in the public opinion in Russia, looking at the surveys, um, the public um, Russian population has been following its leadership in condemning uh, Ukraine um, and considering that they are the ones to be blamed for what's happening. But at the same time, when asked, uh, do you want to go for a war with Ukraine? A vast majority was against that uh, because precisely they see it as a civilian war and they don't want this. So this has to be watched carefully as it uh, unfolds. And um, uh, the third a parameter to take into account is the international scene. I spoke to a little bit about European, the European neighbors, um, but watch uh, the vote in the UN General Assembly that should take place today or tomorrow, I don't know exactly. Watch the abstention and how many uh, abstention uh, you will see from African countries, from some Asian countries, from Latin America, from the Middle East. Will we see the same thing as we have seen in 2014 with Crimea, where only 100 nations voted in favor of um, a resolution against Russia and the others mostly abstained? Or will we see a high number of people unhappy with what is going on and unhappy with uh, Russian uh, behavior? Um, Watch China and then India, countries that maybe could play a role as honest brokers um, and who so far has standed on the sideline and haven't wanted to, to intervene. Uh, this is what we're going to see in the, in the near future. Let me end with the long term, and uh, I will be very short on this. What we're witnessing today is the end of, um, of the... Uh, sort of peaceful coexistence that we have been witnessing uh, since the beginning of the, uh, of the, of the century. Uh, a post-Cold War that was very unstable, but which at least had avoided to some extent uh, major conflict. We had some, unfortunately, in Georgia, as I was saying, uh, in 2013 in Crimea and Eastern uh, uh, Ukraine already. And unfortunately, once again, uh, but at least we were still relying on a set of arrangements uh, that had managed to keep uh, somewhat uh, the European security order moving ahead. This is gone. Uh, this is gone. The Helsinki Agreement, the Paris Charter, uh, uh, the uh, NATO-Russia um, founding act of 1977, all this is gone and we will have to rebuild something totally new. Are we moving back to the Cold War as it existed uh, before the end of the um, Soviet empire? Um, I'm not so sure because the world is different. The world is totally interconnected um, and uh, we are living in a multipolar world. Um, but we are certainly going back to uh, days, um, very difficult days, um, and we will have to try to rebuild something slowly. This is for the long haul, once again, this is the long game, uh, but we'll have to find ways of rebuilding this. And it will be difficult, starting with what do we do with Ukraine that will be divided, maybe totally annexed to, uh, uh, to Russia that may disappear? How do we do with the massive package of sanctions that we have taken? Um, what do we do with uh, building up a new humanitarian uh, support uh, for Ukraine in the years ahead? That will be the issue we will be facing very quickly. I'll stop there and I apologize, Professor, for having been too long. Uh, Ambassador Vimal, thank you very much. Um, your remarks certainly are sobering um, as befits the circumstance, whether we like it or not. But we very much value your uh, providing uh, some scenarios against which we can consider where the energy and climate uh, parameters are now going. With that, let me pass the floor uh, to Gerson Heiser from Clifford Chance. Um, Gerson, the, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Yeah, well, um, my intention is to, is to give a, a, a brief and, and broad overview on, of the developments with respect to the sanctions in particular of the European Union, which have been imposed um, over the last days. And um, 
to point that out, um, this is an unprecedented development. Um, it has never been, there have never been such uh, huge and massive uh, packages of sanctions imposed by the European Union or by other, uh, by other jurisdictions with respect to Russia. Um, with respect to Russia, perhaps to, to start, um, the, 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 the sanctions of the European Union were first imposed in 2014 um, in, in, in relation to the developments uh, with respect to Crimea and Sevastopol. Those sanctions at the time were rather limited to um, sectoral um, aspects, uh, to, to, to sectors of, 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 of the industry, especially the financial industry. Um, there were some sanctions with respect to, um, to, um, to oil and gas, delivery of, of goods, items related to, 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 to the production of oil and gas. Um, however, there was not a, a massive comprehensive um, restriction of business with Russia. These sanctions have um, for quite some time uh, not been amended. Yeah? Um, they were imposed in 2014. There were some amendments with, uh, still within 2014, but thereafter it was uh, rather quiet with respect to, to, to the Russian sanctions. And um, well, now a couple of days ago, a, a cascade of new sanctions uh, was started, uh, not only by the EU, but, but also by the US and the UK and certain other jurisdictions are, are joining. Um, uh, the, 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 the imposition of, of sanctions packages. Um, I, I, will, I, will, I, will, I will shortly go into, into some more detail in that context, just to, 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 to highlight um, these sanctions have already led to, um, to some economic measures imposed by uh, the Russian government, which also have implications for, 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 for um, yeah, for especially for for Western um, Western entities, Western persons um, holding shares in Russia, um, on and 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 um, being participated in Russian entities when it comes to the, the distribution of dividends. Um, so far, oh well, yeah, um, you were right, Jonathan, at the beginning um, when you mentioned that um, that. Um, um, there is still some room for 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 the, the transactions with, with respect to energy. Yeah, um, the sanctions which have imposed so far do not specifically uh, fully restrict uh, energy um, 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 trade with Russia. Yeah, this is intentionally, as far as is reported. Especially, um, I must confess, I'm, I'm, I'm in Germany. Especially, um, 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 it appears that Germany um, um, was reluctant to impose um, 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 further sanctions with respect to that. It's, well, there are, of course, important important relations with Russia when it comes to to oil and gas. Um, and nevertheless, um, the, the the German government already on the 22nd of February, uh, so rather early, and when it comes to the cascade of, of new sanctions. Um, communicated that they um, would stop the certification procedure for Nord Stream 2. Nord Stream 2 being the, 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 the gas pipeline project, um, 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 uh, being a pipeline between, between Russia and Germany uh, through the Baltic Sea. Um, and it, it has been a project which, had, which has created um, 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 disputes um, on the one hand within the EU and on the other hand between the EU or between Germany and the US uh, over, over some time. And, and, and finally now uh, Germany decided to, to stop the certification at least for the time being so that this pipeline won't, won't um, 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 get active, um, at least not shortly. Um, apart from that, um, there have been several sanctions um, 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 uh, been imposed by the European Union when it comes to, to, to the financial and capital market sector. Yeah? Just today, um, a, an exclusion from SWIFT of uh, certain Russian banks, certain larger Russian banks was published. It was communicated or announced already some, time, some days ago that this will happen. Today, um, the names of the banks have been published and, and the legal act, act has been published. Um, um, just a couple of, of hours uh, prior to our conference now. Um, apart from that, the, 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 the energy sector, um, or, yeah, the, 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 the export of certain goods with respect to the energy sector has been further restricted by the European Union. 
um, items um, um, uh, necessary for the refining of oil um, um, have been have been included in the export restrictions. Um, the purpose there, as was reported, is to um, to deny Russia the access to to certain specified um, 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 technical items which they need for their for one of their core industries. Nevertheless, um, still the 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 um, the trade with oil and gas has not been has not been blocked. Yeah, um, of course, the 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 exclusion from SWIFT of uh, relevant Russian banks will make it um, rather difficult for the Western world to um, to execute transactions. Um, this will be a practical problem. It's not a not a, a prohibition on, for example, a purchase of oil, uh, but it's a, a prohibition on 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 SWIFT. But the purchase of oil will have difficulties, or his bank, its bank, will have difficulties to um, to execute a relevant transaction with a listed Russian bank. Yeah, um, it's important to say, but but uh, but you, Ambassador, you also pointed out that uh, to say that this is all an ongoing process. Yeah, uh, it may well be that tomorrow we are talking about uh, um, um, additional sanctions. Yeah, um, there have been several packages which were published over the last days, uh, which by itself is an unprecedented um, approach. Um, the, 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 apart from the SWIFT exclusion, yeah, um, which probably will so far not have that many, many impacts on the, uh, the, the, the trade, um, uh, on the energy trade, there were several listings of, um, of individuals um, individuals which hold um, relevant positions, high positions, um, and in 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 particular uh, state-owned entities. This by itself will most probably not uh, not lead to um, the relevant state-owned entities being considered to be blocked, yeah, under EU sanctions. But nevertheless, this is something which would need to 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 yeah to be monitored. It um, may well be that further persons will be will be included. Um, that also further entities will be included in those lists. And if this would be the case um, with such entities, um, principally any trade would be prohibited. So far, so far this has not been announced. Yeah, um, and it appears that there's a still a still willingness to keep um, the lines for energy uh, supplies open. And uh, I understood. But I may be wrong there. I understood that this is the same from the Russian side. Yeah, that um, um, gas and oil supplies are still taking place and and shall keep on taking place. But um, um, uh, this isn't this isn't anything which 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 can be which can be promised from both sides. Um, we and I'll will... just ask you, Gerson, yeah? to bring it uh, to a wrap up point, uh, if I may. Awesome. I apologize for interrupting. No, no, fully correct. Apologies. Um, perhaps at the last point, yeah. What what we are currently seeing, and this is a development which will need to be monitored as well, is that um, uh, several entities are closing um, closing the plants in Russia, um, and that that there are problems on the Russian financial market, which will or which can possibly also have impacts on. The trade with energy, um, because possibly they will also have impacts on the um, energy entities in Russia. And with that, I will hand over to you. Thank you very much, Gerson. Um, your point is well taken that this is an, a still dynamic situation where what we see in place today could very much be superseded by additional measures. Um, thank you for your remarks. Let me now turn to Dr. Kirsten Westphal. Uh, Kirsten, um, we would be very interested to know um, the energy response from Germany um, as you are seeing it unfold. Um, you are obviously a very experienced uh, observer of both the international, uh, the European, the, the global, the, the, the European and the German perspective. Over to you, please. Thank you so very much, John, and thank you very much to having me. It's, it's an honor. Let me first start with, of course, the disclaimer that I'm talking in my personal capacity. And as we all said, it is a very fluid situation. And I can just give a, a snapshot. 
So it's it's far too early to really uh, describe uh, you um, the full picture of what Germany is doing and will do with regard to Russian gas, but also oil and coal. And this is my first message. It, it's a much broader challenge, and I will come to that. I would uh, basically like to make three points. The first point is the paradigm change in Germany is real. My second point is gas. Um, there the issue is prepare for the worst for crisis contingency, but also provision and decarbonization. And the third point is, of course, we will see an acceleration of renewables and hydrogen. My first point, back to my first point, we are seeing and witnessing multiple and fundamental paradigm shifts in Germany's security and energy policy. I just hint you to a point that we now see that 2% goal in the budget spending um, is out there. We have a new 100 billion special fund for German armed forces. And with regard to um, energy, the shift is clear that we look at Russia no longer from the angle of interdependence, but an analyzing vulnerability. So we are shifting from idealism towards realism. And exactly the point that has been made, the idea of peaceful coexistence is, is um, at the moment set aside because we're seeing that all institutionalized trust, so the channel that we're having, the mechanisms, the work with the companies is basically has crumbled. The other paradigm shift I'm seeing that climate change has been very much a priority of German governments, the society, and there the shift is towards balancing that with regard to the strategic triangle and really looking into security of supply. And then, and here are question marks, we might also see a paradigm shift from markets towards a more strategic approach and Ordnungspolitik, as we say. And of course, the idea of natural gas as a bridge is also crumbling and there's much more sensitivity now to natural gas as lock-in effect. My second point that I quickly want to make is natural gas, as I said, it's, it's a very fluid situation, but of course we have to prepare for an emergency situation. We have to think around contingency and provision and a phase out. We have 50, approximately 55 BCM, more than 50%, of our gas is coming from Russia, but Germany, as you all know, is, is a hub for natural gas and, and, and a lot of gas is transited to other countries. Uh, but it's, it's, it's simply to say that it's hard to replace. And the question is indeed, are we talking about an abrupt cut of flows or a slow phase out? And uh, to answer that, it's very important to look into where gas is going to in Germany. And there I would say we have 12% into commercial heating, 30% into re residential heating, and 6% in, into district heating. And around 25% is used for process heat in the industry and 5% for feedstocks. And then you have around 80%, 18% of, for electricity generation. And it's only here where the discussion starts whether we might need you know, a prolongation of, of, of coal-fired power plants, but, but here the phase out is foreseen in 2030, and the idea would certainly be to accelerate um, other fuels. And of course, we're talking around the three nuclear power plants that are still running. So basically, if you look, the question is, how can the protected customers and strategically important gas-fired power plants be supplied to? And this um, is, is, is the major challenge when we talk around emergency and, and contingency. And we are already seeing that industrial processes um, reduce their consumption of gas basically because of the high prices. And this is really the, the huge knock, effect, knock on effects that we're seeing with regard to ammonia production, fertilizer production. So we all know that, that, that energy prices are ha having a huge effect on prosperity in other sectors. But if there is time, uh, and, and if the idea is, of course, when, when, on the longer run to save gas and reduce natural gas to kind of an optimal share where it can be diversified. 
Um, when I come to the immediate reactions around gas with oil steam that the certification of Nord Stream 2 has been stopped, this might um, most likely result in, in insolvency of Nord Stream 2 AG. We are also seeing that the decision has been taken to build um, and speed up two LNG terminals, most likely Wilhelmshaven and Hospital. This will be financed. And we, have, uh, we are expecting a new law for a storage regime, which is kind of what I meant with there's more an element of ordnance politic now regulatory issues coming up. My third point to be very quick, of course, we will see an acceleration of the NAG vendor with the prioritization that we're knowing already first energy savings, but this will take time. It's an incremental process in the building sector, but we will most likely see more um, money um, put um, there too. And of course, electrification, but then of course, hydrogen and its derivatives. And if I say prioritization, it might be a political prioritization, but not a temporal sequencing. So all should happen in parallel. As I said, the idea of natural gas as a bridge has a, at least, to say the least, a big question mark. Um, Germany has always been very clear in the message that public funding will only be spent for green hydrogen and green derivatives. Um, and of course, we will see more sensitivity than in the past around natural gas lock-in effects, so more question marks around pyrolysis and, and blue hydrogen. And this puts, of course, a bigger question mark using natural gas as a bridge, for example, in the steel industry. So we're looking into new um, vectors, probably. What I think will be and, and should be the talk, this is my hope that we will see an acceleration um, of both for imports of hydrogen and derivatives, as well as inside Europe, a, a push to use all instruments that we have already at hand, which the instruments that I'm working for, H2 Global, but also um, the hydrogen backbone that is in the development, and also um, the important project of common European interest to establish hydrogen valleys and basically to, to bridge the instruments and to, to, to lift it to a higher level and to use all the synergies. I also think that um, Germany within the European Union should and will push for a stronger strategic push to build up interconnectivity with neighboring regions via hydrogen and PTX channels, plus also the idea, hopefully, of traded market structures as, as a platform for um, more transparency and price signals. So let me conclude because time is running out. Um, to be very clear, there is um, in, 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 in the gas uh, peers, there is the clear understanding that we should not look onto, on Germany alone, but we are really talking about Northwestern Europe. Uh, the challenges are in Northwestern Europe. And we have to think through that we might also have to supply Ukraine. And we are very aware that this all will also have knock-on effects on, on the global gas markets and the ability of um, other countries to buy ever, ever more higher gas. Thank you. Kirsten, thank you very much for those remarks. Um, let me now turn uh, to our my colleague Pierre Noel, uh, who will give us a sense of the possible response from the global natural gas market. Pierre, over to you, please. Yes, thank you very much, uh, John. And let me share this just to uh, just to support <clears throat> my uh, my talk today. Can you can you see? Can you see my screen? Yes, you can. Yes. Okay, fant fantastic. So it has been mentioned already that the natural gas is actually still flowing, which could be considered surprising even if you know, all of the things, uh, even if it's marginal, I would say, compared to the human and uh, humanitarian and, and military events that are unfolding is, is a is a is 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 good surprise. Let's say uh, natural gas is still flowing from Russia to uh, to Central and Western Europe, 
but there is a clear risk that the flows will be, could be disrupted in the uh, days or weeks to come. And there is certainly, uh, the, 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 there are elements that are not just anecdotal, that the European Union member states are in the process of making a strategic decision to, over time, move away from their uh, gas relationship with Russia. And we'll go back to those two possibilities at the very end. But the first thing to say is to acknowledge that if we were, we as, as Europe, uh, if, if Europe was to lose its gas trade with Russia, this would be a big problem, not a, not a small one. Uh, to give you an element of comparison, the lost energy would be about 60% larger than the disruption we had in January 2009, which was perhaps already the largest uh, disruption in commercial energy in the history of energy markets. Uh, this would be 60% bigger, and it would be about twice in, in primary energy terms, it would be about twice the crisis that Japan went through after it had to shut down its entire nuclear fleet uh, in, uh, after the 2011 um, <clears throat> earthquake and, uh, and tsunami. So uh, in 2012, they shut down their entire nuclear fleet. This, for Europe, would be a shock twice as big as, as, as what Japan went through. So a big problem for Europe. But the important point to consider here is that it would be a global issue, not a, not a European one. Um, the uh, Europe is the place where seaborne natural gas, known as LNG, liquefied natural gas, competes against pipeline natural gas. Uh, Russian gas is pipeline gas. And if we were to lose our Russian gas, of course, we would immediately, to all the extent possible, turn to the LNG market. So it's important to keep in mind that our gas relationship with Russia is worth about a third, just under a third of the global trade in seaborne natural gas. So the, the European crisis would be transformed into a global one by, uh, by energy, energy, energy commodity markets. And that's exactly my second point. The, the market for LNG is global, and therefore it, it will globalize the crisis. And the, the, the first region to uh, uh, feel the impact will be Asia. Asia is another very large importer of LNG, actually la far larger than Europe. Uh, and our spot prices for LNG have, have converged because there's an increasing degree of, of arbitrage, of, uh, possibility to reroute cargoes uh, between the two markets. The, it's not only, a, it's, gas is not only global, but it's also substitutable. In all of its usages, you can replace it by, uh, by other fossil fuels, oil products and, uh, and coal. And therefore the oil and coal markets will also work as forces that globalize the uh, European crisis as people make choices about which fuels to run. Longer term, there is a lot of natural gas in the world that can be commercialized as LNG. So uh, uh, there's a lot of LNG that can meet the additional European demand. There's, I shall say, unfortunately, from a climate perspective, there's a lot of coal that can also be uh, developed for, for Europe. And of course, renewables and nuclear uh, will, uh, are available options uh, for, for European countries as well. So the point is Europe can, and if it chooses to, will move beyond Russian gas. There's no inherent reason why it could not do it. The flip side of that is that 
Russia, to some extent at least, will replace European markets. And it has started to diversify away from Europe uh, quite some time ago, a long time ago. Nearly all of the growth in uh, Russian natural gas exports have been either LNG or uh, pipeline, pipeline to China. And this is not only continuing, but accelerating. So by 2025, it is possible, depending on how much gas still goes to Europe, it is possible that the aggregate Russian natural gas exports might be equivalent to what they are today, or they could be up to, uh, up to 90 or 100 billion cubic meters less than they are today. But Russia is very unlikely to be marginalized as a natural gas exporter by uh, any uh, by the, the potential disruption of its relationship with Europe. Of course, it's important to note that uh, the, the, the price to pay for Russia would be a very high degree of dependence on China as a natural gas client. The third and last point is that timing matters. Whether we talk about a catastrophic collapse in our gas relationship with Russia, or a European strategic choice that is implemented over a number of years has radically different implications on two aspects. One is the cost of what's uh, happening to us. Uh, and the quicker you want to do things, the more expensive it is. And the other one is the uh, climate or CO2 emissions impact, because if we rush to replace uh, um, your uh, Russian gas, the system cannot uh, invest soon enough into new LNG export capacity and certainly not into new nuclear or dramatically accelerating the renewable uh, cap capacity in, in Europe as well. So you're left with the more carbon intensive options, including unfortunately uh, coal. So it's much better for us if we plan for it. And if we can, depending on the countries you're talking about, accelerating the growth of nuclear, renewables, demand reduction through uh, efficiency, especially home insulation. And of course, via probably a new generation of contracts, uh, expanding LNG supply capacity worldwide. And please remember that it's not a European problem. It's really a global one. The two issues that I've just mentioned are very well relevant for Asia. It's much better for Asia if Europe plans for its moving away from Russian gas than if it has to do it in a hurry. The, the CO2 implications in, uh, part, in particular uh, will, be, will be global and and. and it's exactly what uh, my colleague Harrison Fell will now talk about. Thank you, John. Pierre, thank you very much for those remarks. Um, we now turn, last but not least, uh, to Dr. Harrison Fell. Harrison is going to uh, give some thoughts on the implications for climate policy and CO2 emissions. Harrison, over to you now. And if you're speaking, you are muted. All right, now we're making progress. Here we progress. go, sorry about that. Okay, um, I'm going to speak a little bit today about um, the uh, climate policy responses for the EU, uh, as well as for the US. Obviously, as um, Pierre just noted, this is a, um, a global issue. Uh, when we start to think about the climate implications, but I'm going to focus on these two regions explicitly. Um, so with respect to the EU, of course, the EU already has a goal uh, of net zero uh, emissions by 2050. And, and unlike, say, the US, they have have and have had uh, policies in place for, for multiple years now to help move them in this direction and achieve this goal. So the question is, what changes uh, in light of this invasion 
um, in terms of the, the climate policy and, and reaching these net zero goals. And in my mind, uh, what changes is the speed at which this might occur and um, potentially the resolve of the uh, member nations to, to stay on this path. Um, and as we, uh, as Pierre sort of noted, um, and others have as well, I think a major question um, that we have here is um, clearly there is a, um, a motivation and um, a, a um, concerted effort, um, it, certainly if you think about their larger 2050 goal, to, to wean uh, the EU off of um, Russian gas and, and fossil fuels um, writ large. But the question is, how quickly is this going to occur? Is, is this a matter of months uh, or is this a matter of years? Now, um, some of the language coming out of the EU Commission now and, and various member states is, is thinking of a more of a multi-year process, but um, sometimes we don't get to choose uh, those uh, actual timings. Um, and clearly, if this, the quicker this occurs, the quicker uh, the EU has to um, get off of uh, Russian gas, um, it's going to be more expensive. There's, there's hardly any way to think that, that it wouldn't, right? We would have to um, uh, see some pretty massive investments. We have a carbon market that would respond to that as well, uh, that, that largely would um, create higher uh, carbon prices. Um, that's going to put upward pressure uh, on, on the cost of all of this. Um, and, and so then the question becomes, will the, the member states uh, have the resolve to, to remain on this um, carbon-free path to, to replace um, uh, all this gas and still hit their net zero goals? So with that in mind, um, what are some policy changes that might be needed to um, help smooth this transition um, and, and increase the speed. And so a few things that come to mind for me is, um, I think uh, one thing that, that needs to be considered here is a, a revisiting of the cost containment mechanisms within the um, emissions trading system for carbon in the EU. This of course has already been brought up as, as, EU, as the EU has been uh, in an energy crisis for um, several months now, predating, uh, predating the invasion. Um, and, and to a large extent unrelated to anything going on um, with um, the Ukrainian situation. Um, they do have a mechanism in place with a, a so-called market stability reserve, which um, inputs uh, more permits uh, depending upon the aggregate bank uh, of the uh, regulated entities. Um, I think we're certainly seeing a situation now where perhaps that is not sufficient uh, to contain prices uh, and um, provide relief uh, to not only industry, but also households as um, some of those, a lot of those costs are passed on to um, end consumers. Um, I think there's also going to be um, need for other policy instruments um, or expansion of, the, of some existing instruments, particularly those around um, supporting electrification. As Dr. Westfall noted, a lot of gas uh, in Europe goes to um, heating, residential heating, uh, home heating, um, to, to get off of um, gas reliance from Russia, you're going to need to shift those homes from, from either um, natural gas heating to electric or, or some other source. Um, but electrification certainly seems to be a, a major um, component of that. So there will be a, there'll, be a need to, to do a considerable push uh, on the residential side as well as to some extent, um, probably on the industrial side as well. And these are policies that are probably going to have to be separate from the um, sort of centerpiece of, of the EU uh, climate policy, which is the emissions trading system. Um, and the reason is that the emissions trading system, while those prices are going up, is going to put upward pressure on electricity prices, um, which will in itself um, disincentivize electrification, um, but electrification in the end will be needed, obviously, to, to help um, reduce reliance on natural gas as the electricity sector itself um, moves away from fossil fuels in general. 
And and that and that goes to the final point here, which is that I think there's going to have to be an increased commitment to all zero emission um, generation sources, including nuclear. Obviously, there has been a lot of um, discussion, particularly within Germany, uh, to to retire and and move away from nuclear generation. Um, I think it's going to be very difficult to to continue on that path um, without creating substantial uh, uh, pain in the energy sector if the movement away from natural gas, um, particularly Russian natural gas, is um, a relatively quick movement. Um, so I, I think that's something that definitely will have to be um, revisited uh, by Germany and, and perhaps expanded in other regions. Certainly France has already discussed that and, and we'll see where it goes in other areas. Moving over to the US, um, in terms of the US climate policy, well, it, it has been a mess for quite a while. Um, this was uh, way, way predating uh, anything going on in the Ukraine. Um, certainly even more recently, um, what we've seen unfold with the Build Back Better Act uh, and its um, implosion uh, uh, does not bode well for US climate policy at the federal level. Now that said, there has um, actually quite a bit of action going on at the state level and there's been a, a lot of push um, at the state level and within individual corporations to hit uh, various uh, emission reduction goals or, or even um, net zero goals. So what changes now in light of, of the invasion? Um, as Pierre noted, uh, there's going to be uh, likely a, a major shift to LNG. Um, this is going to increase demand for US LNG um, and possibly oil, depending upon what um, Sanctions may possibly come down the line for oil or, or um, geopolitical strategies um, that Russia or other countries may pursue vis-a-vis um, -vis oil. This all might um, uh, increase um, demand for both gas and oil within the US. And I believe that's going to really test the resolve of, of a lot of large US institutional investors that have, um, to some degree, been trying to move um, away from investments in shale plays and oil and gas more generally. Um, whether or not they remain on the sideline, I think could almost be a moot point because at some point the money is going to be good enough that somebody's going to come in, whether that be private money uh, or, or smaller investors. Um, now, why would this necessarily be uh, much of an issue for climate other than this just simply one could think about it as replacing one sector's one country's fossil fuels with another country's fossil fuels. I think the big part here um, is the ability to regulate emissions within that sector. Um, specifically, methane has been a big um, point of emphasis of the EPA uh, recently. Um, so if we see a massive ramp up in, uh, uh, in shale oil or oil more generally in the US, um, will the EPA be able to regulate that right now the Supreme Court of the U.S. is is um, hearing a case, um, West Virginia versus the EPA, that could potentially severely weaken the EPA's ability to regulate greenhouse gases, including methane. And therefore, if there is this massive um, increase in demand for LNG and, and potentially oil within the U.S., um, there could be some climate um, impacts associated with the production of that. Um, and I think another area to consider and, and something that um, the ambassador brought up at the beginning is, is thinking a little bit about what China's uh, role is going to be in this conflict. Um, clearly, China is, is, real, is, is important um, in our U.S. Um, climate policy because our U.S. climate policy is really a pro-renewables policy. It's really a um, subsidy policy uh, for, for um, renewable energy. And our... Um, our uh, renewable energy sector um, relies heavily on a supply chain um, that uh, China is, is a critical member of. Um, so thinking about China's role uh, in this conflict and, and whether that may disrupt these um, uh, supply chains uh, uh, could be very detrimental to um, the US achieving uh, or, or pursuing some um, larger federal policies. I'll leave it there, given that we are near the top of the hour already, uh, and, and look forward to some questions.
Thank you very much, Harrison, for those remarks um, uh, and for helping us to understand the, the climate aspects of what we are looking at. We now move to question and answer. And I thank those of you who already are submitting questions. We'll try to get to as many of them as possible. In that context, um, I will ask uh, to our speakers uh, what are impossibly complicated questions and ask them to reply in impossibly short uh, answers. Um, I remind that uh, we are on the record today. Uh, so, and this uh, recording from this event will be made available both on the website of the Center on Global Energy Policy and through our YouTube channel uh, shortly after uh, the conclusion of the event. Ambassador Vimal, um, my half-joking uh, comment about impossibly difficult questions uh, will be revealed as truth with this. Um, Alden Meyer of E3G asks uh, a question which I'll give a version of, which is, can one envision a scenario moving forward uh, that is so injurious to um, the, the international order and views about uh, uh, law, propriety, the values that are in the UN uh, charter, et cetera, that one could see Russia being disinvited from multilateral fora such as the G20. Would this, can one en envision it? Would it be a good thing, a bad thing? What are your views here, please? This is what we did in 2014 with the G7, as you remember. Um, Russia was a member of the then G8 and was uh, suspended. Um, can the G20 do this? Um, I'm not so sure at the moment, because in the G20, you have, among other uh, members of the G20, uh, countries from the Middle East, nations from the Middle East, which have so far uh, stayed on the sideline and um, refused to be marginalized. Um, I was thinking you were going to ask me another question, which was, can the Russia be suspended from the UN Security Council? Because this, I think, has been a request put forward by President Zelensky. And I'm not sure we can do that either, because a lot of uh, members of the UN Security Council and more generally of the UN whole system um, would be somewhat cautious about this, thinking that this weapon could be used against them another day. So I'm not so sure that at this stage, we would go into that direction for the time being. Thank you. And indeed, you underscore the, the, the challenge here of uh, exerting pressure against deeply objectionable behavior. On the other hand, needing channels for diplomacy and they exist, this, these two thoughts exist somewhat in tension with one another. Let's move to a question on sanctions issues. Uh, by the way, uh, to our participants, I note with regret that um, uh, Dr. Kirsten Westfall had to depart the program at the top of the hour, which uh, I very much regret, but um, that's the reality of these times. Uh, on sanctions, um, a question that I think probably rightly goes to Gerson uh, first and foremost, though I encourage others to jump in if you see fit. Um, uh, Luisa Palacios, one of my colleagues at the Center on Global Energy Policy asks, is overcompliance with sanctions a risk? What does that look like? What does it mean? Could you explain what overcompliance is for, for that portion of our audience that is not familiar with uh, the notion of exceeding the requirements under sanctions? Is it a risk and what are the possible implications? Um, I would understand the, 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 the term overcompliance um, as, 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 yeah, um, either interpreting uh, the existing sanctions in a way which exceeds uh, the, actual, uh, the actual scope or for whatever reason, for reputational reasons or commercial reasons, to to rely on sanctions for 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 refraining from entering into transactions, although um, 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 uh, sanctions do not 
um, necessarily prohibit such transactions. Yeah, what we are what we are um, seeing is that, and uh, this is to some extent also understandable. Um, what we are seeing is that 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 the market, due to the uh, severe developments with regard to the sanctions regimes, um, is is under pressure and 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 is also somewhat insecure what to do yeah because you 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 need to you need to to assess in detail your your your, your different relationships your investments and so on and uh, several several parties um, um, as long as they have not had a chance to assess that in detail uh, had to have taken the decision to just stop everything yeah? everything with regard to russia and of course and now to, to to the second aspect of the question yeah um is this is does this also uh, entail risks yes um it it entails um now, with respect to Russia, it entails um, um, commercial risks, uh, civil law risks that can the counterparties um, uh, try to, 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 to hold one liable because there's no, uh, no um, a basis for rejecting a transaction, no basis for, for, for denying to supply goods. Yeah, uh, this is one aspect, but I think that um, there, there many, many things will be in flow because it's, it's currently it's the entire market which is unsecure what to do. And 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 possibly don't know whether, but but possibly there 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 may also be 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 courts later on taking the view that in this situation um, one was was justified to 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 take the decision to primarily or, or for for the time being to stop everything, um, also for for potentially for for huge reputational aspects. <clears throat> Thank you. And let me just ask one more question to you while I've got you, Gerson. Um, uh, Mike Fullwood from Oxford uh, Institute for Energy Studies uh, uh, raises the question of whether the SWIFT um, measures that have been put in place would actually be that big of a barrier uh, to some of the oil and gas trade, uh, particularly long, under long-term contracts where it's a, a regular payment and, and so forth. Is that a potential um, obstacle? Um, I, must, I must confess yeah, that, that, that uh, technicalities of, 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 of the transactions, uh, um, I'm not, not an expert in that, yeah? But um, it will, of course, it will, of course, limit and restrict the possibilities for 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 bank transfers with the relevant banks. Yeah, and here again, here again, um, there may also be um, a cautious approach by uh, the institutions concerned. Yeah, where we where we again are, are with your with your first question to me. Um, I think that also this also this um, might have a wider a wider impact. Than it at uh, first glance ha in, in, intends to have, and this is what we have seen over the last days, that that uh, the, the the measures imposed uh, had a, a, a sig significant and severe impact on other on other angles which were not primarily targeted. So I think um, it might be that that there that, that there will be or remain some ways to 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 carry on existing existing relationships but nevertheless uh, this will become really difficult there is there are different or meaning for 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 a, a trade um within russia or with other jurisdictions yeah there are other payment uh, messaging systems in place but for the western world i think it will become difficult um Perhaps, perhaps one aspect, yeah, um, and it's not an immediate exclusion. It's an exclusion as of 12th of March, but this is only 10 days. Point taken. Thank you very much for that. Let me shift now to a question that comes from a Columbia student, um, Bavia Ja, who uh, poses uh, a question about what, under the current and developing circumstances, what does energy security look like for Europe? How can Europe um, enhance its energy security? And perhaps I might turn to you, Pierre, with, uh, with that question first, though I very much uh, invite comments from uh, other part, uh, others of the speakers if you have views on this. Pierre, what's your thought about increasing energy security for Europe? 
It's a difficult one, John, because it really depends what is meant by this. I would say that if what you care about is being able to cope with a sudden disruption, sudden large scale disruption in the flow uh, of Russian gas, then what you need to do is as quickly as you can make your gas fired power plants be you know, able to run on oil products, for example. That's an energy security policy that addresses a short term pressing risk, if you want, right? Uh, if by energy security for Europe, you mean precisely what I've tried to, uh, to, to cover as well, which is over a number of years, moving away from Russian energy while still uh, being on track with your climate goals, then it's a totally different answer. You know, then what you need is probably re-empower governments in energy policy, uh, mobilize, European nations' resources, uh, financial resources, uh, technological resources, much more directly uh, towards the goal than, uh, than has been the case so far, and therefore perhaps uh, uh, emphasize less market me mechanisms in your policy mix and more command and control ones. So again, uh, without a description of what is meant exactly by energy security, I think I could only take two examples. All right, thank you. Um, and let me pose a question that comes from Jake Schmidt, which uh, is in a way related um, to, to one version of uh, energy security or security of supply of, of certain parts of the European energy resource mix in any event. Um, what barrier, what are the barriers to increased uh, LNG supply to Europe? Um, is in, an increase in LNG supply the solution, as some are saying? Uh, well, I mean, the, the, the ability to import more LNG is certainly part of the solution to uh, cope with the risk that the immediate risk that we are facing now. Uh, part of it is controlled, I would say, within Europe, and that's alleviating some of the bottlenecks that may uh, exist in the infrastructure, either regasification capacity or transmission capacity from the coasts of Europe towards uh, the heartland. Uh, but part of it is outside of Europe, and that's probably the most important part. So you, the market cannot, at short notice, significantly increase uh, the global LNG supply. So what you're talking about is redirecting supplies from primarily Asia to Europe, uh, and the 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 mechanism that would allow that is a fairly dramatic increase in the price for LNG. In other words, you make Asian consumers pay for uh, Europe's energy security. So uh, the, 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 there are certainly things that can be done within Europe, but uh, the bigger part is that it's a global market and, and it cannot respond in the very short term. Thank you. Um, let me uh, pose a, a question which I think kind of comes to the, the junction point between uh, the politics, the uh, security of supply considerations uh, and sanctions. This is from Anastasia Shahidjanova, uh, who asks, which actor is more likely to shut off the flow of gas into Europe? Russia or the European Union? You want to start us out on that one, Pierre? Okay, so um, I don't know which one is more likely. I can see reasons why uh, those two options uh, could happen. And um, I don't know which one is more likely. I, I have the same assessment of the situation we are in that has been expressed already in this, uh, in this conference. 
uh, that uh, uh, the EU has been careful not to directly impact its ability to import Russian energy uh, as, as it structured its sanctions. And Russia uh, has been, for now, uh, uh, attentive to uh, maintaining the flows of uh, contracted flows of energy towards Europe. If you really pushed me and wanted an answer, I think that uh, it is, is the, the risk of Europe or European sanctions becoming so drastic that uh, European companies can no longer uh, pay for Russian energy. I would see that as more likely than Russia cutting off Europe. Got it. Um, I, I again encourage the other speakers, uh, if you have thoughts on any of these uh, questions, to please jump in. The more it's like a, a, a discussion among you, the better. Um, <laughs> and yeah. please fire away, Ambassador Vimont. I, I could just jump in, but, but to support what Pierre has just said. Uh, uh, from what I can understand, by the way, this is. Uh, and, and you know what could be the next sanction package from the European Union? This is certainly one possibility that is being studied at, at, at the moment. And, and furthermore, what I would like to add is that sanctions on the European side now have become to, to a large extent very emotional. You know, what was thought impossible one week ago, be it a Nord Stream 2 suspension or uh, moving into the whole SWIFT business and banning uh, Russian banks from the SWIFT uh, system um, has suddenly appeared uh, quite possible and um, Europeans have gone ahead. And of course, they have reached already a high ceiling. Um, uh, and if they want to go further, now they have to go precisely into the sectors that uh, a few days ago, once again, they would have perceived as, um, as an impossible objective. So I think we have to be aware of that. This could move very quickly now. Well, let, let me piggyback on that question and, and pose one or that answer and pose one question that uh, comes from Seth uh, Hetena, uh, who says, in essence, um, uh, shouldn't one, in fact, um, impose sanctions that cut off oil and gas? Isn't that the only way, I am paraphrasing, the only way to really um, deliver stout enough pressure against uh, President Putin's actions? You care to comment on that one, uh, Ambassador Vimal? Um, when we were talking about overcompliance a few minutes ago, <laughs> I was thinking that uh, we were already there to some extent, after all, the big US or British companies, um, uh, energy companies that have decided to um, cut their direct investment in, in their Russian counterparts uh, have taken the debt decision without being forced to do it. Um, I understand I've heard this morning that Apple was stopping its sales to, to Russia. So we are witnessing more of this happening everywhere. And to come back to the question, I think, for instance, the Apple decision will have a major impact on the Russian population, um, as it would have if something like that would happen in Europe uh, tomorrow. Uh, so I think we have to watch the global picture to understand uh, what is going on at the moment. Uh, uh, and, and so, um, I'm not entirely sure that gas uh, and oil uh, will be the only ones that will have a major impact. And furthermore, could I add another point? Uh, much of these decisions uh, are of a long-term impact. Um, they, they, uh, they, uh, there will need to be time before the, uh, the um, uh, impact on the population will have some, some effect whereas other decision may have a major direct impact and a short-term impact. So I think this is what needs to be taken into account. After all, what are we trying to do with these sanctions? 
it's to make things move in, in, in Russia, not only at the level of the leadership, but also inside the local population to make people start putting pressure on, on their leaders. Um, I'm not so sure if it, this will be successful, but this is certainly one of the goals we're trying to fulfill. Thank you. I'm very glad that you, you made that point um, because in part it, it links to another question. I will, I'm not sure that I will pronounce this person's name properly, but Jonah or Yona uh, Koka asks, asks a scenario that we should all hope for. If there is an agreement between Russia and Ukraine to end the war, should sanctions be lifted? And, and maybe Gerson, I could ask you uh, to come in second Ambassador Vimont, I would ask you to, to, to speak to this first. Gerson, the, the modification to you is, how does that look for, for companies that are focusing on compliance? Is it an overnight shift or, or what? But Ambassador, first to you on uh, the how the sanctions might end. Uh, first of all, as I said earlier, the scenario of... Uh of um, a quick uh, stop uh, ceasefire and a stop to all of what is happening at the moment doesn't seem to me the, more, the most plausible at, uh, for the time being. Uh, um, otherwise, I don't think President Putin would have gone into this uh, military uh, adventure, I would say, um, uh, so, so easily. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm, once again, I'm not sure this option is the one we should be looking at. Uh, but even if that would happen, sanctions are not going to be dismantled in one evening. Um, we will, you know, Western countries um, will ask for um, many conditions and for all the necessary safeguards uh, before lifting the sanctions. We want to be sure we need all the guarantees, political, military, um, and, 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 and others of the same type uh, before lifting, uh, lifting our sanctions. So I think you will see much more negotiations around this uh, before a quick ending, uh, a quick uh, end of these uh, sanctions. Thank you. And Gerson, your, your perspective? Um, well, you, you referred to, 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 to the potential reaction of, of, of entities with respect to, respect to compliance. Well, I, I, having had a look at the, at, the, at the scope and the wide range of the sanctions currently imposed, and possibly, possibly in this context, the, the cutting of, of, of long-standing relationships between, between Europe and, and the US and, and, and Russia, I don't think that it will be that easy to just, um, even if the sanctions have been have been lifted yeah, at some point in time, to very quickly reestablish uh, the, the the current or, or, or previous um, uh, economic relationships, and that uh, there may be some. But that's looking into the crystal ball. Uh, there may be some reluctance. It may also be uh, practically difficult uh, to reestablish um, reestablish um, the, the, the the links. So I don't think that it will shift the world um, uh, overnight if the sanctions um, are, are in fact lifted. Thank you for that. And again, uh, one should hope that we end up in a scenario uh, where the hostilities come to an end as quickly as possible. I, I wanna turn to you, Harrison, with a, a question that one hears um, different versions of and, and some of uh, this question are also reflected in the audience uh, uh, queries. Um, in a time when one has um, very material, very specific tensions about security issues um, in Eastern Europe, how should European, I know you're not a European policymaker, but how should policymakers around the globe be thinking about climate and the climate agenda on the one hand versus very short-term security of supply, uh, national security considerations on the other. Is there still room for climate uh, policy under the current circumstances? Well, that's a good question. Um, 
I mean, certainly this is a, a, an extremely pressing situation um, that um, requires um, a, a work from a lot of actors to resolve. Um, I do think what, as many people have mentioned within these talks today, that you know, one thing this is clearly highlighting is is um, regional dependence on other regions' resources and um, energy has always highlighted um, the troubles with that. Um, and to some degree, the extent that um, Europe and other regions um, can, you know, I always dislike the, the phrase energy independence, um, but um, to some degree to which they can become less reliant on the fossil fuels um, could perhaps be um, a, a a strategy not only for coping with this, but um, also with climate change. There's an article in the LA Times about this, about um, pushing forward. You know, this is really a great push for for renewables um, from both the geopolitical um, framework as well as from obviously the climate framework. And so perhaps um, this could be a rallying cry um, um, that is beneficial to both. Um, so I, I wouldn't necessarily say it puts climate off the table. Um, but perhaps some of the solutions to this um, conflict can be um, also viewed within the climate lens of, you know, what can we do to um, create a win-win of sorts. Got it. Okay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, we're, we're just about out of time. Uh, and so rather than pose another question and, and run over time, I think I will um, take advantage of this moment uh, to thank very much our um, four panelists uh, uh, who are with us now and our fifth, Dr. Kirsten Westfall, who had to uh, jump off uh, a little bit early due to a prior commitment. Um, the sad reality, uh, I suspect, is uh, evident to all of us, and that is that the implications, whether in regard to diplomacy and security considerations, uh, market considerations, energy, climate, all of this will continue to unfold in the days ahead. Uh, I, I hope that we have a circumstance of a relatively sooner resolution of the violence that is currently unfolding in Ukraine. Um, let us all hope that that is where we end up. Um, our event. There will be a recording of it that will be posted on our website, which is energypolicy.columbia.edu. On that same website, you can find uh, many other pieces of information about upcoming events of the Center on Global Energy Policy, as well as scholarship um, podcasts uh, and a, a host of other information uh, that may be of interest to uh, today's viewers. With that, Please join me in thanking our speakers uh, and we wish you a good remainder of your day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.